Hi. A while back I did a video on the Raiden RD6012 12 amp 60 volt power supply but we only looked at this part of the power supply. So this accepts voltages up to 70 volts and gives you your regulated output. Now what I said I'd do in a future video is have a look at putting it into the chassis kit and connecting it all up. And I thought today what we do is have a look at the insides of the AC to DC converter. It's quite a powerful unit. We'll see whether it's actually safe to use and then we'll quickly assemble it into the case. And then you'll be able to use it for all of your PCBs. And uh, speaking of PCBs, don't forget to visit jlcpcb.com, which is today's sponsor, where you can get high quality PCBs manufactured in as little as 24 hours for just $2. And more recently, they've started offering four layer PCBs starting at just $5, making these high technology boards more and more accessible to hobbyists. And don't forget to use the code JLCPCBCOM for a discount on all of your future orders. Right, so that's about enough of that. Let's actually get on with having a look inside the power supply. It's quite a chunky device. Uh, this one is rated for 70 volts at 11.4 amps. And it's in the style of those enclosed power supplies that you can get with a branding that looks kind of similar to a Meanwell. I think they are kind of trying to rip it off. But let's get ahead and start taking this thing apart. Right, so this is what it looks like on the insides. And the construction doesn't look too bad. Obviously a little bit more care could have been taken in some places. But nothing immediately strikes me as being dangerous. Obviously the main safety element is going to be the transformer here. Which we're not going to take apart. But I might do an insulation resistance test on this just to check the isolation. But it looks like some kind of half bridge converter. Maybe an LLC because we've got some inductors here. And quite a big film capacitor here. But basically what we've got is the AC coming in through a fuse. We've got a bleeder resistor for the capacitors here. We've got our filter. So capacitors from phase to neutral either side of the common mode choke. And then we've got our capacitors here between the line and neutral to earth. Then we've got a quite large bridge rectifier and some inrush current limiting. Uh, we've got oddly a relay here. I'm not quite sure what this is doing. This is a 12 volt coil relay. So this is driven by low voltage somewhere. I'm not quite sure what this is doing. When we take this out of the chassis, we'll have a look underneath and see what it's connected up to. But we've got a switch here to switch between 230 or 115 volts. And that basically switches these two large bulk capacitors in different configurations. So these are 1000 mic each at 200, vol 200 volts. When we've set it to 230 volts, these two will be in series. So 400 volts with a 500 microfarad rating. It's a little bit low. You'd normally like to see this as something like a 275 volt capacitor. So there's a little bit more headroom. Uh, because at 400 volts, that's pretty close to the peak of the AC waveform. Then inside, you can see we've got a couple of transformers here. We've got our actual switching devices attached to these quite chunky heat sinks. The actual device... It's quite heavy, mainly down to these two heat sinks, but these capacitors will be quite heavy, along with these big chokes. Then we've got our actual switching converter just here. And um, I can't actually see where the feedback is. Maybe it's on the underside of the PCB. There should be an op amp or something. It looks like it's got a fairly conventional topology around the DC converter. Then we've got our diode, which is rectifying the waveform coming out of the transformer and we've got a big inductor and series of capacitors here so a CLC it looks like to smooth out the waveform from this transformer to give us our 70 volts. So after having a quick look at the PCB it's now clear what this relay does so the NTC here is limiting the current through to these two capacitors when you first turn it on and then after a given period of time or when the voltage reaches a certain point this relay then switches on and it shorts out the two terminals here for that NTC. So you can see the two contact terminals here. Here's the NTC. And that means that once it's up to voltage, the NTC is eliminated from the circuit and it stops it dissipating heat the whole time. So quite a nice soft start circuit here. You don't always see that in budget pieces of equipment. But everything else doesn't look too bad. We've got um, our mains coming in here and you can see the isolation barrier. Um, here depicted by this line. Quite decent separation here so it go goes all the way through, all the way down here, all the way down here, 
and down here. And we've got slots everywhere that we'd want to see some slots. We've got some holes underneath the transformer, probably primarily to promote some airflow through here as well. They've not gone for a straight cut because the actual device is quite heavy and that will compromise the uh, rigidity of the PCB. So nothing too alarming here. It probably could have done with a little bit of a clean. There's some flux residues and that kind of thing here. Possibly what looks like a dry joint just on this lead here. So I might have a closer look at that. But everything else looks pretty good. This is the high current DC side. And you can see lots of copper. Lots of blobs of solder to try and increase the current carrying capability. Along with some fairly decent design ideas here. So you can see here, rather than taking the line off from the nearest point, they've separated it so that we don't get the current loops where you don't want them. So um, yeah, it doesn't appear to be uh, too badly designed actually. Everything looks okay. Let's have a look at the actual controller section. So the switch mode power supply I see is the KA3525A, which is a very common and very versatile switch mode power supply IC. It's got a lot of pins because you can use it in a whole range of different topologies, probably almost every topology that you might want to design for without going for something more exotic. You know, you can use the various blocks individually and because it is configured in that way, you can connect at the various bits and you can create a book converter, boost converters, you can create flybacks, and in this case, some kind of uh, half bridge design but they're very common and really quite low cost, which is why we tend to see it in a lot of these Chinese power supplies. I think we saw it in the bench power supply, the high current bench power supply that we looked at a while back and a few other designs as well. So, you know, really quite a nice device and no real surprise that they've used it in this power supply. It doesn't limit the maximum current. This isn't doing any of the switching. This is just controlling it. The actual switching is done by these large MOSFETs here, IRFPS 40N50Ls, and these are anywhere up to 46 amp MOSFETs. Depending on the ambient temperature, they can switch up to 46 amps. Uh, but yeah, really quite chunky devices. Two of them there because it's in that half bridge configuration, and that is what's driving the chunky transformer just here. We've also got another switch mode IC on the PCB which is providing power for all of the primary side of the half bridge converter and they're using this ST Viper 22A which is an offline converter IC and it's been configured as a flyback converter so we can see all of the standard parts here. We've got our flyback transformer, we've got our diode, inductor and capacitor on the secondary side providing the 12 volts or whatever on this side. And then we've got our feedback through the opto coupler here. We've got our capacitor here across the primary to secondary for EMI purposes. And obviously it's getting its high voltage DC directly from the two uh, bulk capacitors on the high voltage DC side of the power supply. Now I have actually got two power supply kits. After receiving the first one from Banggood, I decided to order a second one. So I've got two lots for the lab. But the power supply that came the second time is only rated at 65 volts as opposed to 70, which is fine for the Raiden power supply units. But oddly, this unit also came with a resistor. And it's quite a powerful resistor to place across the output terminals. It basically says there'll be some high frequency noise if it's powered up without significant load. So um, I didn't get one with this one, so maybe this one doesn't suffer from the same problem. But we'll try it with and without and see what it actually sounds like. So when you buy the chassis, you get everything inside it that you need to wire up the device. You've got all your connection cables here. And everything here actually looks to be really quite decent quality. If we have a close-up of the connector here, you can see we've got proper copper wiring in here of the correct diameter. It's also crimped really quite nicely, so it's pointless making your own cables here when everything here is all made up so nicely. So we'll be able to use those directly. It comes with a switch, but unfortunately you can see the cheapness coming in here. So this is probably a factory reject. It was printed incorrectly the first time round. Uh, I guess it's at the back of the device, so it doesn't matter too much. Um, we've got our AC connector here. And this appears to be fine, no complaints there. It's got all of the uh, markings that you'd expect. And then we've got a little bag here with some feet and various screws to hold everything in place. So on the power supply itself, it's got some threaded bosses here. And this is what lines up with the holes in the chassis. 
which means that we can just use the standard screws here that come with it. We don't need any nuts because it just screws directly into those bosses. So we'll start off by attaching that in place. So just the five screws there into the threaded bosses. You can see there's also holes for other power supplies that you might be able to fit here. They tend to have a standard footprint. Next off, we'll put the feet in, and those also use those pan-headed screws. And there's four threaded holes in each corner, and they just screw straight into those. And in fact, rather than screwing this all in by hand, why not use the Wow Stick 1F? It looks a little bit sketchy, um, but this is an electronic screwdriver, so let's have a quick look inside here. So a quick two minute review, but this is basically what you got inside the Wow Stick box. So you get lots and lots of different screwdriver types for mobile phone disassembly and that kind of thing, uh, along with your more standard bits. The weird sort of vibrator end is actually just a desk stand, so you sit that on your bench and then you can have your screwdriver sticking up in the air like that. It's rechargeable, so you've got a uh, micro USB charger port here that you just plug in and it charges. And then on this end, you've got your hex bit holder, along with a ring of LEDs for screwing things in and out and so that you can see what you're doing. So let's give this a quick go on some of these chassis screws. So it appears to have a fair amount of torque, it does those up quite nicely and you are able to add a bit of additional torque if you need to by hand so you can screw it in and when you let go of the buttons it actually locks the shaft so presumably it shorts out the coils in the motor but then you can rotate it by hand if you need to give it that extra little nip up to make it really nice and tight. I think it did come with a demagnetizer in the box as well, or a magnetizer, so you can have your bit sticking to it. So, um, yeah, it's got one of these magnetize and demagnetizing affairs, so you stick your bit through it if you want it to be magnetized, or you put it at the end here to demagnetize it. So that seemed to work quite nicely. So that's all of that bit ready. Next, we want to put in the switch and the IEC connector. Um, so we'll just slide this in and then the IEC connector screws in. So we're just going to use some of the countersink bits that came with it and it did come with a couple of nuts as well for the other side because this is not threaded. So I'll just dig those out. And quite nice we've got a hinged cover. Normally these just unclip but this one is hinged and when you're connecting up these crimp terminals you want it to sit underneath that square of metal. So you've got your screw head, the square of metal, and then the actual crimp terminal underneath that for the optimal connection. Now on the back of the front panel, it does have four terminals for the DC to spread the current carrying capability across uh, two conductors each for the positive and negative here. And they do actually provide all four leads. So on the power supply itself, there's three connections for the common or zero volts and three for the 70 volt supply. So we'll just attach those up and that leaves us with a spare set of terminals for that um, resistor that we need for the minimum load. On the back of the unit, there's a connector here for a thermistor which came with it. And this is just used to display the system temperature. So we'll probably place the thermistor somewhere around here on the power supply so that we get a reading of the temperature inside the device. And the actual front panel just nicely clips into the front, so pushes through the aperture and clicks in. That gives quite a nice satisfying click and holds it all in place. Next what we'll do is just quickly tidy up the wiring with a few cable ties. Uh, we do need to plug in this and make sure that the polarity is correct. There we go. And let's just get some cable ties and tidy all this up. So unfortunately there's not really anything to attach these from to stop them just flying around so I've looped a cable tie through one of the vents here to hold it loosely in place. One thing that I probably would have done if these crimp ends hadn't have been on here is probably put some heat shrink sleeving around the mains conductors at least at this end. At the moment what I've done is I've made sure the DC cables are all the way out the way from the mains so that the um, you know, the minimum distance isn't contravened. You don't really want these sitting together just in case the insulation fails. So this is out the way. It's about the best that we can do. 
And I've attached the thermistor to the power supply just here with some aluminium tape. So that will give an accurate reading of the temperature back here. And so I think we are ready to test it. And the little wow stick seemed to do a good job of doing all of the terminals up. So let's power it up and see what happens. So I've finished assembling the three devices that I've got. This is the lower power RD6006, which I never actually got round to building up. This one obviously has a much smaller power supply and a slightly different configuration, slightly different chassis as you can see. And this one also has a fan at the back, which needs this little fan controller board to sit here. And on this model, it has a little temperature sensor, which is free to float about around here. And I think that controls the speed of the fan. Uh, this one also got a bit of damage in shipping, so the ear is bent on here. These two are the higher power units, the RD6012. And they must be from slightly different batches because there's just a few slight differences in the chassis. A couple of the holes are threaded on one of the versions where they aren't on the other. Uh, and a few little things like that. So in the centre we've got the 70 volt power supply. That was the one that needed the load resistor, which we haven't got fitted at the moment. But it has occurred to me that the power supply unit itself that converts from AC to DC is powered up all of the time unless you switch it on and off at the back. There's a soft power switch on the front, but that relies on that 60 to 70 volt supply being active. So when you've got this resistor fitted, which is a 2K resistor at 70 volts, that is dissipating almost 3 watts all the time. So that's probably not something that you want to leave on all the time. So if it really does need this, I might either consider buying a different power supply to fit in here or um, seeing what we can do actually about the noise inside the power supply. Now, in my lab, I obviously built this um, unit that allowed me to turn off all of the equipment at night. So I've got a nice easy way of turning everything off anyway. But that might be something that you want to consider if you are thinking about building one of these units. So I've got this all connected up. We've got the a fluke connected to the 70 volt output from this power supply. So let's turn it on and we'll see if it also makes any noise. And I'm not sure if that is coming out on the audio. There is a slight high power whine, but on this device, the fan appears to be running. So, I mean, it's almost dwarfed out by the sound of the fan running. And if I turn off the button on the front of the unit, and the fan is still running on this device. So I'm not sure if that's a fault. Uh, I wouldn't have expected the fan to be on all the time. Let's try this unit here, which is the 65 volt version. And that one does not have the fan running all the time. You can see that's at about 65 volts. I don't know what the adjustment range is on this one. It does go up to 70 volts anyway. But I think 65 is perfectly fine. We only need a couple of volts headroom above the 60 volt maximum that this can output. Uh, but that one doesn't appear to be making any noise whatsoever. So I might try this under load and see if the fan does spin up. But bear in mind, this is the latest device that I received. This one was about a month earlier. So maybe they realized that this 70 volt power supply didn't quite work as well as they would have liked. So I've got the power supply connected to the DC load. I've decided we're not gonna look at the waveforms because the DC load itself is going to skew those waveforms. What we need is a high power resistive load and that will give us a better indication of what the noise output from this power supply is. But for now I've just hooked up the Fluke 289. This will give us an indication of the voltage actually on the terminals because I don't have the sense wires connected to the DC load. But also the 289 is very good at giving an indication of the ripple in terms of the AC ripple here because this actually works well up to quite high frequencies. So let's power on the power supply set to 12 volts just nominally and we'll turn on the load at 1 amp so 12 watts and the very slight squeal has gone now so I can't hear that at all so just a little bit of load there takes the squeal away but really the fan is dwarfing that noise um, it's not really picking up any uh, ripple there so 000, zero, zero volts AC let's increase the load some more so 60 watts now, and I've just heard a fan spool up. I think that's on the back of the PCB. So nothing too concerning there. Let's increase the load even further. And again, not really any trouble here. It seems to be coping with that quite nicely. The regulation is still pretty much spot on. It's still 24 volts there. 
so that all looks to be working quite nicely. About 10 minutes in and everything seems to be doing quite nicely. Um, 275 watts and everything's coping really well. The temperature has just creeped up slightly to 28 degrees, but no problems whatsoever. So I've switched this over to millivolts AC. You can see it's about five millivolts. Really, the noise seems to come in with higher currents rather than higher voltages. So if we drop the um, voltage down a bit, just so that the load can cope. If we then increase the current, you can see that's where we start to get a little bit more ripple, 30 millivolts AC, but certainly nothing to worry about too much. So I'm quite happy with how this is working. I'll just quickly check the other power supply where the fan didn't start up and see whether that comes on under load. So this has been running for quite a few minutes now at almost 300 watts and the behaviour of this power supply is a little bit different. So that fan at the back seems to modulate on and off once the temperature rises to a certain point then it turns it back off once it's dropped below that threshold. So it would look like either the 70 volt power supply is faulty or it didn't implement the same mechanism on the fan control system. So I might have a little bit of an investigation. The main problem is that when you've got this turned on but turned off with the soft power on at the front, the other one still has the fan running the whole time. This is the newer version, so if you were to buy one of these, this is what you're going to get. Uh, they obviously decided that 70 volt power supply wasn't up to the job, uh, as, as well as having that problem with the inductors squealing slightly. So that's a look at these RD6012 power supplies and the chassis and the AC to DC converter and how to assemble it all together. And overall I'm quite impressed with the general quality. We did have that issue with the 70 volt power supply in that the fan is on all the time. But the newer version with the 65 volt supply that you can tweak up slightly higher appears to have no problems. And the quality of the parts that come with it, so the cables and the crimps and everything, are actually really quite good. I was half expecting to have to redo everything and all the leads myself, but I'm actually quite happy to use those in this device. Now, I know quite a few people have often asked, why would you bother with one of these when you can spend a bit more and get a Rigol power supply? But I haven't actually seen anything that compares in terms of the output power, the voltage range, and also the current capability. These are currently coming in at something like $140 now at Banggood for the complete kit, which is actually very good value. It's about £100 for the UK and the nearest Rigol that I saw is a dual channel supply but if you parallel them you can get uh, more current or if you put them in series you can get your 60 volts out but it's almost three to four times that amount so you're talking about different devices really and I think if you're after something that was actually really quite precision I wouldn't even be looking at the Rigol power supplies I'd be looking at some of the TTI linear power supplies that are well known for their excellent performance and low noise. Also, it's worth remembering that these are a little bit more modular than your standard power supply. You don't have to use them in this configuration. You don't have to use the AC to DC converter that's provided in this kit. You can power it from batteries or from a toroidal transformer or some other source and use them in a different way. You also don't need to feed them with the 70 volts or 65 volts. You can feed them with a lower voltage if you don't want the full voltage capability that these can provide. Another question that I have been asked a couple of times on my previous video on these units is, is the output isolated from the input? Now, in terms of the front panel module, no, it's not. There's no isolation there. But the AC to DC converters that are included in this kit do isolate the two sides. So you can put these in series, you can put them in parallel, and you could float these up at some other potential. What we don't know and what is not given in the specifications is precisely what the isolation is on the AC to DC converter. So I think if you strung a whole load of these together in series, you could be at risk of causing damage to that internal power supply. You should be able to power that, uh, series up a few of these. Uh, I would expect that the isolation barrier is capable of at least a couple of kilovolts, uh, but just something there to bear in mind. Also, uh, a little note about the wow stick electronic screwdriver that does seem to work quite nicely I'm sure you'll see it in some future videos because it's quite a time saver and it does appear to have a fair amount of torque and also like I said once you're not pressing the button the motor shaft is locked and you can actually apply a lot of force here it appears to be locked completely if you just need to nip them up to tighten them up that little bit more so I'll put a link to all of these devices 
in the description down below. Hopefully you found the video useful and not too long and rambly, but until next time, thanks for watching.